now, uh, I would like to invite Mr. Harold Johnson. Let me read out his bio. It's a very interesting one. According to the birth certificate, this existence began in 1944. The initial 20 or so years were occupied by living in Los Angeles and learning. Then three years were spent in the Peace Corps. Next up was starting family life and existing in Singapore. After a total of 52 years, life shifted to one of leisure a.k.a. retirement. Somewhere, somehow, there was entanglement with Buddhism. So today, with that fantastic bio, let's invite Mr. Harold Johnson with his fantastic title, The Tiger. bit. Uh, I should begin by answering a question that's always asked of me. What's an Ang Mo doing as a Buddhist? Right? Well, actually Buddhism is quite popular. Y'all hear me okay? Are you okay? Quite popular in the Western world. Yes? I don't need a microphone. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now is it better? Okay. Buddhism is the fastest growing religion, if you want to call it that, in the West. It's interesting because it's older than basically all the other major religions. And you say, well, how can that be? There must be something in it that adds something to life that's important. But before I go on, let me mention the word religion. Because we see that a lot. You know, you, you fill out the government form. What is your religion? And they ask you, you know, circle it or cross off the ones you don't want. Actually, Buddhism is not a religion. And people who think that are thinking in an interesting way. If you look at the definition of religion in the dictionary, it focuses on some belief in some sort of super being, okay, who can solve the problems of the world. You know the Lord's Prayer if you know it, then you have some ideas to what I'm saying. So when the Westerners first encountered Buddhism, they would go to a temple and they would see this hunk of steel. Now, is that being disrespectful or bronze? To a Buddhist, no, because we understand this is nothing more than an image, a hunk of steel or bronze, I don't know what it's made of here. But to the Western mind, when they went into a church, they see an icon that belongs to them. And therefore, when they go to a temple, they see this, and they associate that with some powerful divine being. Hence, Buddhism becomes a religion. So I don't think it's a good idea to say Buddhism is a religion. And there are other things where when we speak in English, we have to use the English words that are based on a different culture, a different understanding. You saw the advertisement for the conference, three lovely words, life, death, rebirth. I don't think the meaning of those words in Buddhism is the same as in English, <laughs> all right? We all talk about life. Oh, you're born, you live, you die. <laughs> and then that's in, you die. Wait, there's death. <laughs> and then there's rebirth. So born, leaving, died, rebirth. How long is this death? Well, we say it just happens real quick. And then you're reborn. Or does it happen real quick? 
and some entity wanders around for years. So we have a period of life, a period of a wandering entity, and then rebirth. Now, what is it? What is it that links these three together? What links me with my life? What links me to my death? And what links me to my rebirth? Buddha was very clear. It's not an entity. It's not me that is reborn. And it's not you that is reborn. You think about that. Because if there is, then you can find some entity that goes from one to another, right? And that brings us to the topic that I'm going to deal with today, which is an understanding of what links together life, death, and rebirth. And by the way, if you think about rebirth, if you are reborn, how can that be? Unless you're caught in this perpetual cycle. Remember the film Groundhog Day? Every morning the guy wakes up and it's the same day. It's been used in lots of science fiction. You wake up, it's the same day, same day. Okay, yeah, that's rebirth. But if I was a cow in a former existence, does that mean I'm a cow today, disguised as a human? And what about the next existence? So it doesn't make, to me, it doesn't follow and make any sense. It's good to keep that in mind, all right? Rebirth is a Western word used by the early translators of Buddhism. Another example, by the way, is metta. You know metta? <laughs> Loving kindness. I was always perplexed by what is loving kindness? <laughs> I mean, I, today, I don't know what loving kindness is. But there was another definition. I believe it was Tanasari Bhikkhu who coined this one. He said it's goodwill. When you have metta, you have goodwill. Goodwill means having good wishes for other people. May they be well and happy. May they not suffer. That's what metta is. Then you say, oh yeah, I know that. I know what it means to think that I wish all of you health, happiness, and so on. I don't know what it means to say loving kindness. Not that I don't love you. And not that I'm not kind to you. But that word is too general. It doesn't meet the point. Okay. So let me begin this slideshow. You don't mind if I have a drink? It's water. We all take the precept not to drink. And if someone offers you a beer, you should put that in mind. If you're a Buddhist... You act as a Buddhist, which means you follow the five precepts, which means you don't foul up your mind with uh, drugs and so on. Okay, let's see now. Introduction. That was the introduction. One of the things in my life, and I found it true in Vincent's life too, which was interesting, is I grew up in a house was surrounded by books. My father had done his undergraduate work in USC, by the way. You heard of that? It's in the paper recently. It's where Boney James had his heart attack. Anyway, so he had all these literature books there. And he did his master's degree in philosophy. So he kept all his philosophy books. And being kind of naughty, I suppose, or not naughty, I like to look at some of those books. <laughs> and I was much influenced by one book called The Light of Asia by a man named Edwin Arnold, <laughs> which is a long poem about Buddhism. Okay? And it was quite interesting to be, you know, like maybe 14, 15 years old and try to understand what he was saying. But it was kind of a different approach to Buddhism, and to life in general. 
And then later on, I was maybe 14, 15, I got a job delivering newspapers, not in the morning on a motorbike, you know. I had a bicycle in the afternoon, and I would sit on a corner, and this guy would come and give me the papers, and I would fold them up, put a band around them, put them in a bag, get on my bicycle, and cycle and throw them out. You watch some Western movies, and you can see that happening. But while I was waiting for the newspapers, there was a little bookstore nearby. And so I went in and found a book there called How the Great Religions Began, which has been recently reprinted. So you see, I'm already ancient and old and shaky and all that. So you can tell how old that book is. And it was maybe from the 1930s, I don't know. And so it goes through the different religions and talks about, in a matter-of-fact way, how they came about. And to my recollection, every religion, except Buddhism, came about by some special divine influence. But Buddha was a man, a human being like you and me. And he had the characteristics of a man, a human being. He was born, he lived, and we use the word he died, passed away. We usually don't say that for Buddha because if we know enough, we say hip tam uh, nibbana. That doesn't mean he's dead or alive. It means he obtained nibbana. But that impressed me because my background, by the way, and I went on to school and I was in science, you know, like physics, chemistry, computers, and all the good things like that. And having read that book, I, I was thinking about Buddhism a lot. Later on, I was about 16, 17. I was in a life science class in high school. High school is like secondary school. So that would be about 10th grade. 10th grade would be like sec three or so, some sec four or something like that. And so we had partners in a lab, lab work. And I had a partner who was a Japanese girl. And she, I talked to her about that, and her father turned out to be actually uh, an important Japanese priest in Los Angeles where I was living. But she gave me a book to read called The Gospel of Buddha. And that was a very interesting book. It's one of those books where the author picks out the main ideas of Buddhism and presents them there. And you know when you're 15, 16, that's a time in your life when you're breaking out, so to speak, of the chains that bind you, the shackles of your existence, and trying to find out things on your own. And that interested me. Now fast forward, and I end up here in Malaysia. Not here, sorry. I ended up here in Singapore. I ended up in Malaysia and later came to Singapore. It was after separation. It was about 66, I think. 65 was separation, right? Okay. So, I was sent to a rural area in Malaysia. I mean, this was rural. This was the, literally the end of the train line. The train went there and it went any further, it crashed into the ocean. All right? There was one road, windy road, that in those days went to this place called Tumpat, Tumpat Klantan. And I had to find a house to rent. Anyway, it turned out the landlord would become my wife. <laughs> I thought I'd save rent. I did, but lost everything else. No. Um, but she was Thai, and she was a Buddhist. And that kind of interested me, because we would go to the temple. And I could see how Buddhists act what more there was to Buddhism than the academic stuff that I had learned. And that kind of got me interested in Buddhism. And then my contract in Malaysia finished and I came to Singapore. I should say we came to Singapore, a family. And there was a temple that we would go to most of the time because the head abbot there was a very good friend of my father-in-law's. And this was a temple in Chua Chu Kang called Wat Utamayam Anyuni. It was a famous temple in Singapore. 
because the founder of the temple was restored to have all kinds of important powers and things. So we go there now and then, and then ultimately the uh, abbot passed away. The temple kind of remained stationary for a while. Physically, though, it, the, temp, the uh, conditions, of course, deteriorated. And ultimately, I became the president of the temple. And I thought, just a short term. Short term, I'm still there. It's been like 10 years or 12 years or something like that. So you get kind of involved in Buddhism, okay? And, and you get involved in it, particularly once you retire, you have time to think about things, to reflect on them. And the one thing you learn is, if you're interested in being a Buddhist, it's not because you were born as a Buddhist. <laughs> Nobody is born as a Buddhist. You may believe that, but it's not true. You're born as this hunk of DNA with some bio me in you, right? You can ask Dr. Charles about that, huh? That's what you are. Buddhism is a choice that you have to make. And when you make the choice, it means you're going to behave as a Buddhist. <laughs> and to behave as a Buddhist in the first line is the five precepts. That has to govern your life, you know? When you have a mosquito buzzing around, you should reflect on that. You should reflect on that. That was the wrong thing to do. I'm going to try to avoid that next time. Then how do you avoid it? Mosquitoes are everywhere. How about you close the windows? Then the mosquitoes can't come in, right? See? You find a solution that's good. Now, one of the things that interested me, as I told you I was surrounded by these literature books, was some of the works by a poet named William Blake. Let's see. And recently I was thinking about this when I was asked to give this talk about a poem by Mr. Blake called The Tiger. But as having this Buddhist mentality, I thought of Buddha and the tiger. Now, what could be more different than that? Well, not very much because, you know, if you live in the jungles of Southeast Asia, particularly in Buddhist time, there were lots of tigers around. But William Blake was an Englishman. Okay? Why would he put together Buddha and the tiger? What do I see in that? And what can you see in that from a Buddhist perspective? Now, if you're going to take an O or A-level exam, if you write this down, what I tell you, I don't think you'll pass. Because what the readers want, they want you to spew forth everything from their culture. They don't want to hear stuff from another culture, another set of beliefs, because the other sets of beliefs are, I'll use the English term, they're wrong. Okay? But you listen, I hope you can learn from it. Here are our two. Buddha, sitting calmly in meditation, and a little kitty cat walking through the forest. <laughs> and what do they possibly have in common? <laughs> well, they do have a body in common, because Buddha is a human, a living creature, and so is the tiger. Right? But yet we know they're vastly different. So he asks the question, what separates Buddha from the tiger? And what separates you from the people around you and from every other living being around you? It's a very interesting question, particularly in this age now where we're talking about individualization. I do it for myself, right? We don't want to have everything the same for everybody. This is it. This is what separates the Buddha from the tiger. Consciousness. This is the one thing that we all have and we all share. We being every sentient being, and maybe not non-sentient beings, is consciousness. 
You say, how can that be? I have my consciousness, it's mine. You have your consciousness, it's yours. You can do what you want with yours. It's different than mine. It's like the air we breathe. Every human being on the earth breathes the air, the same atmosphere. We use the same oxygen, right? It's a general principle. And even more, we're all affected by gravity. If anyone is not affected by gravity in this room, let them float up now. I've never seen it happen, right? We're all affected by gravity everywhere, all over. And it's like consciousness in that respect. We all share in consciousness, but we don't share it as a sort of thing that my consciousness is part of your consciousness. Not quite. But it is universal among all living things. Let me elaborate that a little bit more. Buddha consciously reflects before acting. Acting being thought, speech, action, and so on. We know the story after Buddha became enlightened, right? He went out for a walk, and he met an uh, ascetic who said, man, you really look cool, Buddha. And he said, yes, I'm totally enlightened. And the ascetic said, no, can't possibly be, and left. So then Buddha was thinking about that, and he meant what they call prop prom, the uh, four-faced Buddha, the four-faced God, uh, Sam, Sahampati is his name, the Hindu God. And, you know, we always like to see one Sahampati. But why does it have to be one? Why can't it be multiple? Anyway, Sahampati explained to Buddha that there are different kinds of people in the world. There are those with little sand in their eyes. There are those with no sand in their eyes. They can see clearly what's what. There are those with a little bit of sand in their eyes. They will struggle to see clearly. And there are those which must, with much sand in their eyes. I want to say they're hopeless, but they're very difficult, okay? You know? I was a teacher. And actually, that hold for students, I was teaching physics. I had some students that could grasp a concept just like that. Explain to them, look, Newton's second law, F equals ma. More force, more acceleration, more acceleration, more force. Thinking massy. Oh, yeah, I understand that. And there are those you've got to say, well, look, you know, a bus and a car at the traffic light, the light's green. The car moves off faster than the bus. What's the difference? They'll see the bus is more massive. Oh, yeah, now I understand. And there are those who say, I want to go outside and play. I don't want to listen to physics anymore. You know, I mean, that's the way it is. So you have a nature like this. And that you're here probably shows some of you have less sand in their eyes or maybe even none at all. And you're headed for much better things. But the tiger is this. I'm not going to read it to you. You can read it, right? <laughs> okay. The tiger is walking through the jungle. He sees a guy collecting batai. You know what batai is? It's very healthy food. Very healthy food. When Charles comes to the house, he thinks it's candy. Okay. Uh, but the tiger is walking through the forest, and he sees the man, and the tiger's hungry. So, all right, I'll go eat the man. The man also wasn't paying much attention. He was so focused on picking the batai that, of course, the tiger attacked him. But the tiger did not consider, if I attack a person, what are the consequences going to be? 
Well, first the person is perhaps clever, he can pick up a stick, or in this case a stone, and fight the tiger off. And then other people will probably come and hunt for the tiger. Now if the tiger reflected on that, I doubt he would attack. He'd say, no, I'll go find a cow or a chicken or some wild animal in the forest. But that's the difference between Buddha and the tiger. The Buddha reflects. The tiger just acts. Now this is a position that William Blake was in when he penned a very important poem that he called the tiger. The spelling, by the way, is Blake's spelling. And when you see this poem printed some places in books, they say, oh, this guy was illiterate and couldn't spell, so they changed the Y in tiger to an I. Blake knew what he was doing. He was an extremely intelligent man. Okay, all read it? Get the idea. In the first stanza, the first four lines are key to what's going on here. If we count the letter Y, we find it occurs one, two, somewhere else here, there are three, four, five, six times. The letter Y occurs six times. Did his finger get stuck on the question mark, keep on the Y keyboard or something? They didn't have them then, so it didn't happen. What is he talking about with the Y? He's asking why is the tiger so fierce? And what is it that the tiger represents? He's not talking about the animal, actually. He's talking about something that's universal. Blake is saying, why is there suffering? Which is dukkha. Why is there dukkha? Everything you read on this page deals with suffering, dukkha, unpleasantness. It's the same question, actually, that Buddha asked, right? Why is there dukkha? But Blake could not answer that question. Okay, but he did bring it to the mind. And the use of the uh, letter Y is just that. Why, 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 why? You know, if you've got little kids at home and you say, pick up your clothes, they say, why? You say, well, don't force them as he, why? We want our house to be nice. Why? Mm, I gave up, pick it up myself. So, this is Blake's idea here. He asked the question, why is there suffering? It's a very important question to answer, especially if you're a Buddhist. Because suffering means things are not going the way you like. <laughs> well, the answer lies, in Buddhist philosophy, in consciousness. <laughs> this word is usually rendered as mind in English, or some form of citta in the Pali language. Mind should be avoided in discussing Buddhism, because very honestly, mind is like metta. Mind has very little meaning to anybody who has put forth any effort. You know, one of the big debates is, is there mind and matter? What is matter? Never mind. What is mind? It doesn't matter. I mean, so you say it's mind, you're just confused. <laughs> Consciousness arises from karma. And that may seem perplexing. If I hold this up in the air, it now has what's called potential energy. 
where's the potential energy now? Same thing with consciousness. When there's karma, there's consciousness. When it's elevated, there's potential energy. But the neat point about karma and consciousness is it can be caught in a loop because a car consciousness also produces karma. And if we let that consciousness go on, we end up with this. The monkey in the mind. You ever heard that? Oh, I can't meditate. Why not? Well, because my mind is like a monkey, running here, jumping there, and all that. <laughs> First of all, it's not your mind that's running here and there, whatever your mind is. It's your consciousness that you say is in your mind, and it's this monkey here. It can't stay. It can't stay on one object. It has to keep moving and moving and moving around. That's what not reflecting does. When you listen to Ajahn Brahm this morning, he says, control your consciousness. Control your legs. No, these are my legs. You get up in the morning, you just throw your legs in the floor, and you say, hey. First of all, you wake up in the morning, you say, hey, body, I'm awake. Hey, consciousness, you're here. Then you put your feet on the floor. Okay, feet, are you on the floor? Yes, they are. Do you do that? Or do you just get up and you're wandering around what to do and so on? What's your mind doing? What's your mind focusing on? If you let that happen, then it's not good for you. Consciousness supports choices of what you think, what you say, and what you do. It's the foundation. A strong foundation is very important. You know, I haven't been to this part of town in about 10 years, okay? I stay in the north part. I had no reason to come here. But I was surprised at all these huge multi-story buildings. Why don't they collapse? Why don't they collapse? They make 25, 30 stories. How can they stand up so strong? Because they have good supports. They put piling in the ground, in case on the ground, and all kinds of things for a foundation, a support that the building are built on. If the support is no good, the building won't stand up. Okay? That's very important. It's important for us, too. Because if we want to have good thoughts, right speech, and right action, this has to come from consciousness, which comes from karma. And the thought, speech, and action generate the karma. So it's a vicious cycle, isn't it? It can go one way or the other. <laughs> but the mind is not still. Anicca, anicca, right? Everything is changing. Everything is dynamic. The mind is also dynamic. <laughs> and if it's the right mind, it follows the eightfold path. <laughs> and these should serve as a check for us as a Buddhist. <laughs> we start off with the right view the Buddhist point of view, of view, anicca, dukkha, anatta. Anything that violates those is, is not worth it. From that, we can get right intention. And from that, we intend to do something correctly. We get the other's right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, concentration, and mindfulness. The word right is very, very important. And the idea that it's changing all the time is very important. Your mind is working always, but it's working under your control. <laughs> now this consciousness that's running your mind can go two ways. You're aware of what you're thinking. You reflect on it. You reflect something that is wholesome. Like, you know, you're, you're walking down the street and someone bumps into you. Do you have mindfulness at that moment? Do you have metta? Do you say, excuse me, I'm sorry? We just kind of smile at him. 
That is an action that is skillful, kusala. That is a good action. Now, not everybody does that, right? Some people will bump into you and say, you fool! Haven't you got any eyes? Right? They'll scold you straight away. I mean, that is unskillful, known as akusala. Now, this word kusala and akusala, as used in the ancient language, describes how a man, for example, is taking his buffalo, water buffalo, in between paddy fields, they have like a, a ridge to walk on, you know what that is, called a bata. And the buffalo walks along the bata, and he sees the green paddy. And so he tries to go and eat the green paddy. And the buffalo herder is able to take a stick and hit the buffalo, and the buffalo knows to go back on. Skillful. That's a skillful action. If the buffalo herder doesn't know what to do, then... The buffalo goes off and eats the patty. That's unskillful. You see? Notice that knowledge is very important. The skillful buffalo herder, he knows how to use the stick to direct the buffalo. The ignorant one, with other things on his mind, his monkey mind jumping around, doesn't know. So we have these two roots open to us every second, every minute of the day. And when you're confused as to what to do, you want to do a smiling face or a skull and crossbones. Immediately eliminate skull and crossbones. Don't follow it. <laughs> if you don't, you'll have trouble. Because when you reflect on something, it can be a kusala. The seeds grow, the karma grows the consciousness grows, and you end up with an old dead tree. An old dead tree. That becomes your life. On the other hand, okay, on the other hand, if you can develop skillful attitudes, kindness, gentleness, thoughtfulness, caring, you'll have wholesome karma. That wholesome karma will sprout into a tree that is constantly producing fruit or leaves or whatever you like. That's what we want. When you're a Buddhist, that's what you want. When I'm a Buddhist, that's what I want. It's not easy to do. Buddhism is not a belief system that you suddenly go down and bow three times in front of the Buddhist image and suddenly I'm a Buddhist now. It is a journey. It is a journey that you work on slowly, as it mentions, rebirth, okay? Happens many times. Buddha was not born as a Buddha. There are lots of stories about his previous existences, right? And each of us will have a another existence, another shot at it. So although you may try very hard to lead a wholesome life, that's very good, and you'll be very happy, and then you say, well, I'm going to die, so what happens? Well, you will continue along that path. Maybe somewhere in your path you've done something wrong. You know the story of um, Angulimala? <laughs> Everybody knows that story, right? Angulimala, the finger guy, he killed 999 people, chopped off their finger and wore around his neck. Then he became an arahat. People say, how can that be? Well, because his existence, perhaps, as a human being, was full of bad karma. But in earlier existences, that karma was very, very good. Okay? And that story is told over and over again. But usually it's to show how bad Angulimala was. Did Angulimala really exist? I doubt it. Uh, there's no other evidence to it. But it shows you may have bad times now, but if you continually try and strive for wholesomeness, in the end, 
that will prevail. And you will be happy. And if you make it really happy, you can achieve nirvana or something close to that. <laughs> now, when you're making choices as to what to do in life, and you always make choices, some choices are very simple. You're going to cross the road, you see the traffic lights red, you wait, right? The red man. Uh, and it's just basically automatic. But some are much more difficult. Much more difficult. Somebody who you know, who you like, is in trouble, and you want to help them, but how can you help them in a way that is good, that is wholesome to them? Well, Buddha said we can examine these if we ask ourselves this. If what I'm thinking, speaking, or doing must avoid all evil. You see the word all, A-L-L, all. You must not think bad thoughts. The bad thoughts will come into your mind. Don't act on them. You hunt on me, I hunt on you back twice, huh? Right? No. You hunt on me, okay, fine. You can kill me, so what? You know, there's a story of a Buddhist monk who went out to a country where there are all these bad guys. And these, these robbers and bad guys, they caught him and tied him down. <laughs> they took the saw, this double kind of saw, you cut wood with, and they cut off his arm. He said, oh, thank you. You didn't cut off both arms. Oh, yeah, okay. And they cut off the other arm. And he said, all right, that's okay. Thank you. And then they cut off his legs, same thing. Finally, he died. And as he died, he said, thank you. Now, I finished this existence. That is avoiding all evil. He could have complained that you cut off the arm of a, of a monk. You are really doing something bad and you're going to be punished. That'll teach you a lesson. No. That wasn't his thought. His thought was avoid all evil. The second thing is to cultivate the good. Do what is right. Do the things that are not evil, that are harmless. Evaluate your choices, not in choices, not in the view of what's good for me, how much money am I going to get, but rather what is harmless. And finally, if we do this, if you avoid evil, you cultivate good, you purify your consciousness. And it's from consciousness that karma comes that your next round of action will come. So it will be easier, you see? It'll be easier to carry on in a wholesome way. Very, very good. This quote is both found in the sutras and in, I think, the uh, Dhammapada. Dhammapada, by the way, is an interesting book to read, okay? Because there are many stories in there that you can reflect on. You say, what? This sounds very evil. But when you reflect on it, there's something deeper in it that makes it not evil. It's your misinterpretation. You see? The Dhammapada, I think it's the first two verses, say consciousness is like a cart following a buffalo. You know, in the old days they had a buffalo or a cow pull a cart. And so the cart has to go in the rut where the buffalo goes. And consciousness is like that. Good consciousness is a good road. Bad consciousness is a bad road. <laughs> now, our consciousness is activated by what are called doors to consciousness. Something from the outside comes in and stimulates our consciousness. And that you, we usually call sati. But sati really means recollection. <laughs> a better name for what we're talking about is called rupa. You familiar with the word rupa? See, English doesn't have good translations of these. Whatever you see through these senses is a rupa. And that, of course, goes inside of you, into your brain. <laughs> There's first tasting. We taste food, right? We all like Singapore, man. Tasting is our thing, huh? eating food, right? This place is so bleak, though, there are no more restaurants around here or anything. No good tasting food. Tasting can be a 
stimulant to thinking. You taste them, this tastes good, but what was I eat yesterday? I ate the same thing and it tasted better. See, right away consciousness is generating these thoughts. <laughs> Another door is through hearing. Right now, you're sitting here hearing me. And that's going into your head. What it does in your head is, is different. You may think, oh, God, I wish that I'm going to get out of here and I want to go eat lunch or something, right? Or, I can't understand him. What language is he speaking? Or, it's nice to hear about Buddhism. Or if you go even farther, you hear, and you say, okay, and move on. <laughs> Seeing is extremely important. It's the most important of our senses because we develop it in this generation and so on the most. What we see enters our eye. So it's important that you keep that in mind. When a thought arises in your mind, did that in mind because I saw something? I saw something I didn't like. It will cause a kusala karma to arise, perhaps. Something you like, kusala. Or something you don't like can also be skillfully understood. It won't last forever. Right? It's the nature of the world. Another one is Smell, fragrance. Smells come in all the time, right? In a room like this, we don't smell very much because, you know, there's no fragrance. But you go outside and you notice there's a fragrance of the flowers, a fragrance of the road, the fragrance of the lorries going down the road. We sit down at a hawker center to eat. We're bombarded with fragrances. And finally, <laughs> we have feeling. Feeling not as an internal, emotional feeling, but feeling as sense data coming in from our body. You sit here, and like Ajahn mentioned, you can feel your legs on the floor. That's feeling, you see? You're aware then of your legs are on the floor. You're aware that you're sitting. And it's always interesting to be aware of the feelings around you and react to them in a positive way. Don't say, ouch, that hurts me. You say, oh. Because when you get old like me, you hurt a lot, you know. We old people, that I'm singing a chair because i got a back problem. I mean, that's the way it is. You feel like that. You say, okay, that's the way it is. It's going to happen. It's not that, oh, i got to get rid of this. I'm going to go have a back operation and all this, and that doesn't work. I'll have, you know, some other operation. And doctors make a lot of money from that. And there's one more source, one more door that feeds into our consciousness. <laughs> Mind or the thoughts that we think all the time, even if we're controlling the monkey, it's still there a bit. We think and we think and one thought comes and it goes away. Just like one sight comes and it goes away or one sound comes and goes away. So the mind generates thoughts and they come and go away. By the way, you know this cat? Yeah. You know, this is a Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland. But it's very fundamental to the idea of our mind working. The mind door. We think about one thing and that leads us to think about something else and to think about something else and suddenly it changes to something else because something else comes in the eye door or something. It's always dynamic. So this idea of anicca is something to keep in mind. The mind is dynamic. <laughs> Here is a parable that Buddha mentioned about the doors. So you have consciousness. 
But consciousness needs something, some food, some fuel, some stimulation through the doors. But you have to be very careful as what goes into your consciousness. That's a good start. Like I said, you see something that's unpleasant to you. You have to know what's unpleasant to you and don't dwell on it. See, Let it go. Here's the idea of that. In Buddha's time, cities had these gates and there's a gatekeeper there and here comes a messenger in on a royal elephant. Come on in. Okay, he can take a message to the commander and deliver his message and go off. And what we want is the things that go into our mind to be wholesome thoughts, to be good, to follow the eight that are listed, starting with right view. So mindfulness is extremely important. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm mindful today. I know what I'm doing, you know, walking or sitting here talking. I'm very mindful of myself. It means knowing that you have these doors and they're producing ideas and you want them to be good ideas. What's generally called mindfulness in English is actually a translation of these three Pali words. Sati, Sampajanya, Panya. This is what you have to develop. I don't know who translated this as mindfulness, but to me it's not a very useful translation. Like I said, mostly I'm doing walking meditation, I'm mindful, oh, I have mindfulness. That doesn't lead me anywhere. Sate is recall, calling into something. It doesn't mean, oh, I have sate, I'm focused on some object, no. When you have something coming in any of those doors, it's not the first time you have ever seen anything like that. So, Sate searches through your data bank, if you want to use the term, your data bank, and it finds something similar, or maybe exactly the same, as to what you are experiencing. Now, Sampajanya is reflection. It's evaluating what you know of this object and the object itself. But how you evaluate depends on panya. We all have panya. It's, usually we don't use it, but it's there. Panya they call wisdom. It's making sure that the result of this Sampajanya the result is wholesome. If the mind sees that this sampajanya does not adhere to the rules of panya, then you don't want it to go in to see the commander. You don't want it to go into consciousness. You don't want it to. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen. But you have to work on it. You have to work on it. Be aware of it. Again, like in the meditation just now, you are aware of your body, okay? And you're aware of it in a good way. And so that can go into your consciousness. If you're not aware of it in a good way, you don't bring it in. You don't say, oh, my arm is too short, my arm is too long. You never think like that, right? Sometimes, though, you do blame your body when you get sick, right? Why am I getting sick? What's wrong with this body? Mm, that's not a good thought. You have to accept it. This is the way it is. I'm sick. Okay, now how can I get well? And how can I prevent spreading this illness to somebody else? And how lucky I am or fortunate that I can have the doctor come and take care of me. It's like this. Every choice we make can be boiled down into two paths diverting, okay? There's a poem with this too, by the way, by a guy named Robert Frost. 
two roads diverged in a narrow wood. And he mentions that once you go down one, it's probably impossible to return to the other. <laughs> okay. Are the thoughts you're thinking about an object, for example, kusala or akusala? If they're akusala, unwholesome, you're heading down that road. And you always read stories of young boys who you know, were gangsters when they were young, were gangsters in middle age, were gangsters when they grew up, and gangsters when they hung, okay? On the other hand, on the other hand, it can be kusala. It can be a wise choice. And then you read, I think there was something in the paper today about this guy, they said ADHL or something, I didn't read it, I just saw the headlines, became you know, a famous hawker or something, you see that? Because he didn't use his consciousness to say, well, I can't possibly do anything, I'm useless, that's rather negative and bad. He said, I can do it, and there you go. He's heading down the right path. And it's very hard to change. It's not impossible to change. And there are stories, like I mentioned, Angulimala, he changed. He changed, right? And became an Arahat. But many of us, we're ordinary people. Um, life is difficult. So we try to make the right choices, the good choices. And we behave in that manner. Don't get mad. Don't curse people. Don't say, why are you like that? Lah. Right? Say, it's okay. You can be like that. I don't think I want to be like that. I want to follow the wholesome path. And here's another common thing that people tend to believe. Right? Every little good deed that you do, every little good thought that you have, every little sensitive speech that you have and so on, they all are adding up like the drops of water. You know, when I take a train somewhere, I can go to Amokyo Station. Then you stay around there, Amokyo? Nobody stays in Amokyo. Oh, this is so sad. Then you go to Amokyo Station. And then you go an underpass to the bus station, you do good. You know, in the underpass, um, there's usually someone, old lady selling tissue, or someone playing a musical instrument. <laughs> and I always give them some money. I don't take the tissue, I got a lot of tissue at home, goodness gracious. Um, but I give them, you know, 50 cents, 20 cents. Sometimes they only have a $2 bill, so I give it that to them. <laughs> why am I doing that? This is why. You see? That's generosity. Generosity is dana. That's giving. Giving illustrates metta. Illustrates karuna. Very good activity. A little bit adds up. There you become happy. I become happy. What's that called? Mudika. Right? Mudika. I'm happy. They're happy. That's good. It's a little step in the right direction. Most people don't do that, though. Most people walk right by. Huh, why is this vagrant person here? Why don't they go out and get a job? They do have a job. Their job is letting you do dana, doing right, getting good merit, good karma, so your consciousness becomes more generous. I should mention, too, when we give food to the monks, for example, on different occasions, when you give the food, make a donation to the Sangha. Don't say, I'm going to get some good karma from this. It's for my benefit, because that's not right. When the minute you say that, that's greed. That's akusala. And so you think it's good, but, but if you think, I'm giving this to the monks, good enough. And they're happy then I'm happy. Karma takes care of itself, just like gravity takes care of itself, all right? 
you go up on Mount Everest, the gravity is less than it is on the Ganges plane. Sure, because you're higher up, and that's the nature of gravity. Karma takes care of itself. So you see that you do kusala deeds, kusala thoughts. I donate this to the Sangha, and they can eat and share with other people around. Well, that's how good. Okay? And the karma will take care of itself. To illustrate this point of a little bit and changing one's attitude, there's this very nice sutra, Kukaratika Sutta, called the Dog Duty Aesthetic. In this sutta, there are two guys in India. By the way, this is a contemporary picture taken in India, maybe 10, 15 years ago. And there are these two guys. One is called a dog aesthetic. They think and act and behave like a dog, like this fellow here. And the other was the ox aesthetic. They think and behave as much as they can like an ox. He goes around and nibbles on grass. This dog aesthetic sits outside the baker's shop, uh, excuse me, sits outside the butcher's shop, and the butcher will throw him a piece of meat, which he will pick up with his mouth and carry around. I want to see how he sleeps. How do dogs sleep, do you know? Right? You have a dog? Dogs turn around three times before they sleep. You don't think so? Huh. So I wonder about him. Anyway, they go and they ask the Buddha, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to us? And Buddha teaches them. He teaches them what's going to happen because of their behavior. Act like a dog. Next round, your wish come true. You become a dog. Act like an ox. Next time your wish comes true, you become a dog. I become an ox. This is the effect of the karma that's generated. Every time this aesthetic has dog-like behavior, he's contributing to that becoming. I should mention the story ends where one of them uh, immediately becomes a follower of Buddha. And in all the stories, of course, they are the hot in the end. And the other one, who had been an aesthetic in a different order, had to wait six or eight months before he also became a monk. But this is a very important story. And it also illustrates free choice. Buddhism is not a deterministic belief system. What you do is not totally determined by your karma. You can make a choice. If it were, if, you, if our life was totally dependent on our karma, and our karma generated more karma, bad karma generates bad karma, we'd be stuck in that Groundhog Day cycle, right? Over and over again. So we have the ability to make a choice. Our choice can be kusala or kusala, skillful or unskillful. You try so hard to be skillful. You're going to make mistakes. Well, I'll make mistakes. But then you don't let the mistakes pull you down. Okay? Now notice this line is very important. We talked about death and rebirth. Rebirth is a lovely English term. But I don't know where it came from. It's consciousness that goes on. It's not my consciousness, it's a consciousness that I've borrowed for the time being. It's not your consciousness because you're only with a consciousness for 50, 60 years or whatever. That's very important to keep in mind. You know, some people have the belief if you cut off your head when you're alive, when you're reborn, you'll be headless. What? Yeah, because you're reborn and you died without a head, so how can you have a head when you're reborn again? That doesn't make sense. 
This is your consciousness. This is what came from a being before into your mind when you were created. This is the consciousness that carries the weight that determines what's going to happen to you or what you like to think. So we have to use that word. Determines what's going to surround this next consciousness. What body, what being is going to surround this. You constantly do good. Life gets easier for you, both here and now. And after you pass away, that consciousness may return as a deva, or even a brahman, or maybe as a person. You know, this is... Being a person is very good because you have a chance to achieve a lot of good in doing that. Okay? Thing we want to keep in mind, kusala. Smiling face is a lovely icon. An emoji, right? right? Smile, I mean, it's good, yes. You see Ajahn Brahm? You ever seen him frown? <clears throat> I can't think I have. He's always smiling. He has a good personality. A lot of kusala. He's doing the right thing. He's not harming anybody. People like to you know, say these things about monks and how bad they are and all this, but people can say what they want. That's their error in speaking. And that's their akusala. If you say this monk is bad because he did this, that doesn't make him bad at all. That makes you bad for saying something bad. Wrong speech. Right? When Ajahn Brahm introduced uh, women back into the Sangha, oh, he got a lot of bad speech, a lot of criticism. What kind of man is he? He shouldn't be a monk and so on, right? I mean, you don't even want him in Thailand anymore. What is that nonsense? That's all Akusala. It doesn't affect Ajahn Brahm. It affects the people who are saying it, though, because they're getting bad karma. He carries on good kusala, and he's smiling, right? Right? You know his story of the brick wall? <laughs> Makes a brick wall, and there are two bricks out of place. Someone comes and says, look at you stupid bricklayer. There are two bricks out of place. Don't you know what you're doing? Well, it's their problem, because they're the ones that are being critical and saying something wrong speech, right? They could say, it's a good wall. Maybe those bricks are out, but, you know. So what? Here's a good example just now. Here's our friend. You know who this is? So Homer, okay? He has a family, I think three kids, right? He works in a plant that deals with radiation. Oh, anyway, he's sitting here and he's smelling these things, right? Okay? Now, that smell, that's one of the senses. And so it's going into his mind, and the sati there is telling him, hey man, those are durians that you smell. And now generating thoughts about these durian. <laughs> they could be unwholesome conscious thoughts. He wants to eat the durian. I want durian. Mmm, durian, yes, durian. Right? Second only to donuts. Right? I mean, addicting, you know. But this is unwholesome. This is craving. This is attachment to something. On the other hand, his mind is, may come up with wholesome consciousness. I want to donate these to the Sangha. Now, these would have to be Sangha probably in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand. In America, I don't think <laughs> they would appreciate it. But he could still donate it. And by donating it, he's having a conscious, a good conscious thought. Okay? Now this Panya comes in and says, homie, you take the donation. He'll complain, but if he does it, he's getting good karma. See? That's how it works. It's like a universal law. So how do you make the right choice? You do it like this. You can't do that with every choice because some things in life are, have to be made real quick, right? Some things take more time. But slowly... You can build this up as a repertoire in your behavior. You examine things, you reflect on them, and decide if it's worth doing or not. Is it wholesome or unwholesome?
This is so important. This mindfulness is what I'm seeing, hearing, touching, feeling, and so on. Is it harmless? Is it good? Should it be followed up? Or should I avoid it? Because it is not good. Now we can practice this. Okay? You all with me now? All awake? Hmm? Select one of your doors. You decide what you want. Just sit there and think, I want to, I'm going to work on seeing, I'm going to work on hearing. We did feeling this morning with the meditation. You select a door. There are only six. Not too difficult a choice, right? Now select an object to enter the door. Homer had the fragrance, the nose. You can use your eye, look at something. See what you're looking at. Look at me. Right? Look at the wall. You can use your ear. What sounds do you hear? You can use your feeling. Okay? You've got an object in your mind at the door, and you do this. Think about the object. Develop a thought about this object that you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, or think. Maybe you think about the football team, the women's team in the World Cup from Australia. And you think it's either a great team or not such a great team. But you think about it. And I thought about it. And I have to now use panya. Evaluate what you thought. Determine, have I thought something good or bad? Have I thought I'm feeling, say, feeling my stomach, I'm hungry? When this is going to end, that's not a good thought. You say, oh, well, okay, I'm hungry, so I had a good breakfast, so it's not bad. And then you decide, is what you're thinking harmless or harmful? Oh, I see what that is there. Okay, harmless or harmful. That's so important. In almost in every aspect of your life, every choice that you make. When you follow these three, then you are a Buddhist. It doesn't matter the other layers put on Mahayana, Hinayana, or anything else, the rituals and so on. If the rituals, though, are harmless, it's good. If they're not harmless, of course, avoid them. There's no Buddhist ritual, for example, in any group I know of, that calls for sacrifice of animals. Right? They can eat, Buddhists can eat meat or not eat meat. That's a different story. They shouldn't eat meat because of what Dr. Charles said, right? You remember that? Meat turns out to be a toxic substance. And it was only the advertising meat farmers that told us it was good. And we said, oh, meat's good, it's harmless. It isn't. <clears throat> what you want is good karma. Okay? Reflect, you have to reflect you have to think about things. I had one person who was a Buddhist and uh, was told that, well, I can't do this. Uh, I can only do it when I meditate. Okay, fine. But that's not right. You have to do it all the time. It has to be part of your way of life. How do you solve a problem? You look at the alternatives and you immediately delete any alternative that avoids, that causes harm or is evil. You keep those that are harmless, that cultivate the good, because these will produce the good karma. And these will make your life better, here and now. And what happens to the consciousness after it leaves this achy old body? Yours is still not achy old yet, so you're okay. Now let's return to Mr. Blake's poem. And looking at it, 
from my point of view, I saw a tiger, tiger burning bright. What is this something that's burning bright? We all can see all around us, it's dukkha. You look all around, you will see dukkha. From the ants wandering around trying to find food to, you know, kings and their mighty palaces. There is dukkha. No doubt about that. That's what Buddha realized in the first noble truth. The second thing, which Blake says, is, is there a cause of it, that suffering arises in consciousness. This is where it comes from. This is where you feel uncomfortable with something. That's dukkha. Or maybe you have another interpretation of something that, you know, it perhaps not. But it arises from consciousness. That's how you have dukkha. That's why you suffer. Now, Blake asks, what immortal hand or eye could frame my feel so symmetry? That is, if we know the cause, we can eliminate the effect. You know this COVID thing? When you went and got medicine for that, right? What people generally did was you alleviate the symptoms of the COVID. You take your Panadol and your cough syrup and all that. You're not attacking the cause of the COVID. Okay? You attack the cause, that's good. You, most of the time you go to the doctor and what's he give you? Antibiotics, Panadol. They make you feel better. But they don't eliminate the cause of the problem. Sometimes, so of course, the doctor has to operate. He discovers a lump in your body, a cancerous lump, and then they have to remove it. And if they do it correctly, then there's no more cancer. So that's the same thing with suffering. There is a way to stop suffering so it's no longer there. You don't suffer. And that's the Eightfold Path. Their frame, I see, fearful symmetry. What is it that makes their dukkha and their sukha? And we want more sukha. So we eliminate the dukkha by following as best we can the Noble Eightfold Path. And that means we develop good consciousness. And that gives us good karma. Don't think I'm doing good karma. Think I want good consciousness. And so I do these good acts. Karma takes care of itself. Just like gravity or energy, energy takes care of itself, right? Even you lift it up. Still is a potential. It doesn't care who lifts it up. The energy is there. So the karma is there. You remember a song a long while ago? Every step you take, every breath you make, well, interpreting that in terms of karma, that's exactly what it is. Every step you take, every breath you make, is determining kusala or akusala. And just replace step in that with actions following the Noble Eightfold Path. And here's another quote from a poem. Notice, it's not Buddha that's going to come down and help you in any way at all. Okay? That's not going to happen. Many people think, oh, I'll go pray for Buddha and he'll come and help me. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen is your behavior, your conscious behavior, is going to determine your fate. Your conscious behavior is going to determine the consciousness that you have and your next existence. Obviously, this English poet has to write things based on his culture. I am the master of my fate. There's no real I am in Buddhism. And the captain of my soul is no soul. But the idea is the same. You are totally responsible. Buddha cannot help you. Okay? He never will. He's just, like I said, not being disrespectful, but this is just an image, right? Okay? Something made of, of material. You remember the Buddha's last words. Those who see the Dharma see me. Those who see me, see the Dharma. That's it, right there. And you understand suffering. And Buddha's whole thing was the cause and the elimination of suffering. And it doesn't happen overnight, though. Okay? So. Thank you for being so good.
My pleasure. Can we say sadhu three times? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much for that very insightful pet full of dharma. Thank you so much. Okay, is there any particular, any particular questions about anything? Nobody? Ah, yes, this is a Singapore audience, huh? I used to give lectures at the Botanic Gardens too, not about Buddhism, <laughs> and asking other people, any questions? And so there, people don't, you don't want to call attention to yourself, you know. Well, you can ask me other time, it doesn't make any difference. If you can, you're welcome to come to Uttamayana Buddhist Temple sometime. On the 1st at 7 p.m., we're having the uh, Asala Puja ceremony, the beginning of the Buddhist Lent. In, it's a, a nice experience. It's a Thai temple. And so it's different than most of anything else. Remember Rajan Brahm trained in Thailand. And the abbot there is very much in the same stream of thought as uh, Ajahn Brahm. Okay? So, nothing to say? Okay, Kim? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. So, if you have any questions, do feel free to uh, go up privately and uh, ask your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, and now, uh, 